Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. From Matthew chapter 4, that'll be our text for today, uh, really zeroing in on verse 3. And the tempter came and said to Jesus, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. Now, Snickers the candy bar has the current slogan that Snickers satisfies. And they've been telling us this for many years. In fact, that's kind of been their their goal is to show that that is the one candy bar that if you are hungry will satisfy all of your longing. And one of their greater campaigns, and and critically speaking, uh, this is one many praise, it was the campaign that started in 2010 uh, titled, You're Not Hungry, or You're Not You When You're Hungry. Remember this campaign started out, again, Super Bowl 2010, uh, with Betty White playing backyard football, uh, some muddy football back there. And in the commercial, uh, at one point she's tackled and and drove into the ground, and she comes back to the huddle, and and one of her teammates says to her, "Uh, Mike, you're playing like Betty White out there. And then, of course, someone gives him a Snickers, uh, gives Betty a Snickers, and uh, she eats it and suddenly transforms back into Mike, and the game goes on. Snickers satisfies is the goal they want you to know, and it's a pretty accurate statement, at, at least that other part of it. It's an accurate statement. You're not you when you're hungry. At least that's the devil's hope when he's talking to Jesus and tempting him throughout today's story in the wilderness. He's hoping that Jesus isn't himself because he's hungry. But to understand this relationship between Jesus and Satan, especially as it is coming out today, we first got to go back into chapter 3. If you got your Bible with you, you'll see the story that comes immediately before today's gospel reading comes the end of chapter 3, that is the story of Jesus' baptism in the Jordan River. And it begins, or it concludes this way, the last verse and a half of chapter 3. The heavens were opened up to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him, on Jesus. And behold, a voice from heaven said, this is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. And if we keep reading and don't stop, the next verse is the start of today's gospel. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Now our Bible has chapter and verse numbers. The back of our announcements bulletin does as well. But those were not included by the original writers. Matthew wasn't writing and he gets to the end. uh, With whom I am well pleased, period, end chapter, begin new chapter number four. We'll write it a little smaller and up a little bit. That way everyone knows where we are. And then he keeps going. Those were added at a later date. So, as we look at today's text, we see this connection that often chapters can break up. We see the connection between baptism and temptation. These two stories are closely linked as the devil seeks to destroy and disrupt what God creates and even what he recreates in baptism. And so our greater storyline moves from the Jordan River now into the wilderness as Jesus begins his ministry. And as he does, we see three different names are given to describe Satan and who he is. And in these three names, we start to get some of his characteristics coming out. So in verse 1 and and a couple other times throughout today's text, we see him described with the name Devil. Uh, The name devil carries with it this understanding of being a a slanderer, one who speaks against and destroys a reputation. Then in verse 3, we get the description of tempter, and we'll come back to that one. That's kind of our focus today. And then in verse 10, he's given the name Satan, which carries the understanding of adversary. So we see part of Satan's nature and just the names given to him. He's the slanderer, the tempter. And he is the uh, uh, adversary. But again, today we're looking at tempter in part because it's such a unique title given to Satan. Uh, That word tempter is only found one other place in 1 Thessalonians 3 where Paul says, For this reason, when I could bear it no longer, I sent to learn about your faith. For fear that somehow the tempter, there's our word, the tempter had tempted you and our labor would be in vain. Looking at 1 Thessalonians, Paul's concern is that the tempter had come, Satan had arrived, and was seeking to drive a wedge between the Thessalonians 
and between God, that Satan was trying to separate them. And the same is happening in today's text. Satan's role as tempter is to divide what God has created. If you are the son of God, he says, Matthew 4, verse 3, command these stones to become loaves of bread. Satan's trying to drive this wedge. Forget about your mission. Forget about your purpose. Give in to your hunger in hopes that Jesus isn't himself when he's hungry. And again, Snickers is on to something because hunger is something we all struggle with. And not just physical hunger like it's 926 and my stomach is growling hunger. Uh, this is hunger that we see throughout Scripture. You go back to the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve, and God knew they would be hungry. He knew they needed food, and he told them, you are free to eat from anything in the garden except the tree of knowledge of good and evil. But in their hunger, they weren't themselves. And in their hunger, with that temptation, with Satan driving the wedge, they were not satisfied with God's good gifts. They ate the fruit, and they fell into sin. Their hunger led to sin. And then we fast forward one, one book later, Exodus. Israel comes out of Egypt. They go through the Red Sea, and as they enter into the wilderness... Again, Jesus is in the wilderness. We'll come back to that in a second. As Israel gets into the wilderness, one of the first things they say, chapter 16, right after the Red Sea, the whole congregation of the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness, and the people of Israel said to them, Would that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by meat pots and ate bread to the full? For you have brought us out into the wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. The people of Israel had hunger. And they knew death was coming. They weren't themselves. They weren't the children of God who trusted in their God, who just miraculously led them through the Red Sea. They weren't themselves. And so God fed them with manna from heaven, that bread from heaven, and provided for their every need. And so then we fast forward once again. Let's go to Jesus now. Jesus is back in the wilderness, right where Israel was uh, at our previous story. That Israel went through the Red Sea, through the water, into the wilderness as that place of preparation for the promised land to come. But as we saw, they grumbled, they sinned, and they were led through the wilderness for 40 years because of that sin. Jesus now goes in through the Jordan River, through the water, goes into the wilderness himself, and he endures what Israel could not. Jesus becomes the entire people of Israel, reduced to one person to fulfill what they could not on their own. And so Jesus was obediently led by the Spirit, where the people of God refused to listen to him. And Jesus now experiences the power of the tempter as well. The tempter appeals to his hunger. And Jesus, uh, at least we can assume, based on what the tempter says, or maybe the tempter is even trying to appeal to the hunger in Jesus' stomach, to the hunger that he can trust in God by leaping off the pinnacle of the temple. He's appealing to the hunger to have the glory of all the kingdoms without any of the pain or suffering that might go with that. The tempter is trying to drive that wedge and separate Jesus from his mission, Jesus from his Father. Je Satan is trying to appeal to his hunger, assuming that hunger is one of the greatest problems, greatest needs that we have. And we all need to eat. We all hunger. We're not ourselves when we're hungry. And hungry we are. Jesus said it in Matthew chapter 5 during the Beatitudes. Blessed are those who hunger. He knows we're hungry. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. And so we hunger and we thirst and we long and we look to fill that which is deep within. We're not ourselves when we're hungry. The problem is we prefer to fill our hunger with something else. Instead, we're like the wolf in the fairy tale who seeks to devour grandma and little red riding hood, thinking that that will satisfy us. If we can just devour others and destroy them, then we will survive. 
We eat what's not healthy, and we eat which won't satisfy. Around the time that we got married, uh, Sarah worked at a group home, and one of the individuals that she cared for at that group home uh, struggled with something called pika. Uh, pika is this temptation, this desire, this drive to eat that which is uh, unhealthy, that which is non-nutritious and, and even downright harmful, including potentially some of those items on the screen before you. But we all suffer from this to an extent, don't we? We pray for daily bread, and yet we prefer to gorge ourselves on that which is the latest, greatest, or that which can give us temporary relief regardless to the long-term harm it causes to us or to others around us. Satan, he tempts Jesus with stones. And he gives him those stones thinking Jesus would satisfy his own hunger there. He's trying to drive that wedge deeper, just as he does to us, as he offers us anything and everything to eat, that we might be separated from God, that we might be separated from each other, or he even seeks to drive that wedge down into us, just like the wedge into wood, to split it in half. And so we take a bite. When I was a kid... Uh, I was probably two years old at the time. So, young kid, we're at church, and my sister is an infant. Uh, and uh, I, I didn't remember this story fully, and I told it earlier, and it was accurate, but then my mom was texting me before the service, and she said, when I was a kid, I used to love to hold my sister's hand. Uh, and again, she was an infant, I'm two, sometimes what kids do. I was a good kid. Well, until the rest of the story... See, we're in church one day, and I must have been holding my sister's hand or so, and Mom said on the text just a moment ago, uh, the Cheerios must have been a little too late coming out during the sermon or so, and all of a sudden my sister just lets out that blood-curdling scream. And it's that type of scream as a parent, you know, you're not going to be able to calm them down uh, in service, and you got to get out because it's going to take a good five, ten minutes to calm down. That type of scream my sister lets out. And as they get out of the sanctuary, and as they're trying to calm her, they look at her hand, and there's bite marks. Apparently her hand got a little too close to my mouth, and I took a bite. But that's the way we are, aren't we? Something gets a little too close to us, and we tend to bite instead, or we want to react or defend ourselves. We are like Mike Tyson and everyone else is a Vander Holyfield with tasty ears that we want to take a bite out of. And as we move into Lent... This season is a time where we recognize those temptations, those desires that burn deep down within our gut. And this is that season where we repent and we return to Jesus and we ask for that forgiveness and that strength to withstand those temptations that are around us. We know we need to eat. That's a reality of who we are and how God created us. The problem is we often eat in unhealthy ways. And yes, in those metaphorical ways we just talked about, but it's even more than that. We recognize that we don't often eat the most healthy. That's why during the season of Lent, we may give up sweets or certain foods or certain drinks in hopes to curb those temptations and those desires within. We need to eat, and yet so many of us struggle with it on either end of a spectrum where we eat too much or we don't eat enough. And there are so many disorders and struggles that we have that revolve around the food that is before us. So hunger is something we struggle with and we need to eat and we tend to eat in the most unhealthy ways, again, metaphorically or even literally. And Jesus knows that. And so as the crowds were following him one day and there's 5,000 of them there and it's close to dinner time, the disciples say, send them away that they may go and find food. Jesus instead feeds the 5,000 and satisfies their hunger. He does it again as he feeds the 4,000. Jesus comes and he satisfies that hunger for healing, that hunger for hope. Jesus comes and gives of himself fully as he ate and drank with many sinners, suffering the criticism that he received in order to give them that hope that God is near to them. And then Jesus was asked one time, that last time, to consume something himself. For you remember in John chapter 19, Jesus on the cross, one of his seven last phrases, he utters chapter 19 verse 28 simply, I thirst. 
And they gave him some sour wine, so that in verse 30 we read, Jesus, having received the sour wine, said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Jesus hungered for death, and he received that. He didn't want it. In fact, he prayed to the Father, remove this cup from me. But he willingly and obediently drank that cup of death that we deserved because of the hunger that we have for everything else. Because of the wedge that's been driven into and through us. But that wasn't the last time that Jesus ate or drank in the Scriptures. In fact, after Easter, on Easter afternoon, we read the story in Luke, How Jesus appeared to the disciples walking to Emmaus and he traveled with them and talked with them. And when they got to their destination, he broke bread with them, gave thanks, and he fed them. And then after he was removed from their presence, the disciples said to each other, Luke 24, verse 32, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? Jesus fed those disciples to Emmaus literally, physically, with Food, and then he fed them spiritually as he opened the scriptures to them. And Jesus comes to you today to satisfy your hunger for hope as he literally and uh, metaphorically feeds you, as he literally and spiritually, that's the word, literally and spiritually feeds you today. And we get that through communion. But then we also get that every time he opens the scriptures to us as Jesus alone has the power to satisfy the cravings that are deep within, what is found in our gut. And we know he alone has that for he says that to us. John chapter 6, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. And in communion, we receive the bread from heaven, the bread of life. In communion, we receive Jesus. And in communion, we receive that blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. And Jesus withstood the temptation in the wilderness that he could then feed you and provide all things for you. Snickers is on to something. We're not us when we're hungry. And in Lent, we take time to confess we are hungry and we struggle because of that. But also in this season, we continually turn to God and pray that he would feed us, that he would satisfy us, that in Jesus, we would see we have all that we need. In him, we would be reminded of who we are and that he cares for that need as well. And so in Lent, we turn to Jesus. We confess. We ask for help as we face these temptations. In Lent, we recognize Jesus has all authority and power over temptation and to forgive us our sins as we ask for that forgiveness for those times that we have devoured other people and other things and as we prepare for that resurrection to come, as we prepare for Easter when we will sing with all the saints once again the victory feast of our God. Amen. And now, may the peace of God that surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and minds together with Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. At this time as we gather our